preparing to study the book of Mark, again, I, until I break into it, uh, I'm not sure the, the, how much detail, because, boy, you can, you can hang on every, uh, every verse, and there's so many, every verse in the Bible has a significant detail in it, and, uh, and, and I want to maybe study the book of Mark on a little faster uh, scale, but I don't know if my study will let me do that because when I see something, I have to stop and look at it, and then and if I learn it, I feel like I'm cheating you if I don't teach you. So, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, but we've been for several weeks now, just kind of um, getting prepared to study the Book of Mark, looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as a whole. I wanted you to see the different aspects that each one have. That is, Matthew looking at Jesus Christ as a king, Mark looking at Jesus Christ as a servant, Luke looking at Jesus Christ as the man, and John looking at Christ as God, the Son of God. And, uh, and they write, it's, it's all the same life of Christ, but looking at it from four different directions and bringing out details that really match who they are. Matthew being someone who worked for the government, Mark being a young person who would be under those that are, uh, have authority over him. Luke being a medical doctor would be interested in the physical makeup of, of the Lord Jesus Christ's humanity. And John being a theologian would want to understand the deity of Christ and, and who, uh, who really Jesus Christ is, where he came from. Uh, that he is the creator who always was. And, and so God uses these men and their personalities to give us uh, these, these pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we started looking at, and by the way, uh, that the, when I had the board up, one of the things that's new to my understanding is to realize how these men wrote, and actually it would span time, not just, uh, not just four attributes of Christ, but Matthew certainly begins, he connects the Old Testament with what we call the New Testament, but he keeps talking about Jesus Christ fulfilling. When you get to Mark, Mark is a Roman citizen, uh, as we studied him, and he has he writes and not only portray Christ, but he has a Roman aspect to it, because as time goes on, the the, the gospel message, uh, the gospel being the person and work of Jesus Christ. It wasn't just for the nation of Israel to know who Jesus Christ is. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is all about the gospel of the kingdom, and we'll see that as we study the book. So that doesn't change, but there is a, a, a slant to the book of Mark that would appeal to the Roman world at his time. And certainly Luke, being a Grecian himself, would, uh, would write and, and, and cover a whole world view of it. And, and Luke, and interestingly, interesting, Mark and Peter line up. Uh, and then Luke and, and, and Paul line up. And so Luke could not only see how Gentiles could be saved through the nation of Israel, but traveling with Paul, he also learned, now he didn't write of it, but he learned how the Gentiles are saved today apart from the nation of Israel. But if you understand what I'm doing, we're advancing from just Jews to Jews, how a Roman could look at Jesus Christ and see him as, as someone who's come to provide salvation or actually a government his government to this whole earth. Then you got Luke who sees Gentile conversion, all men being saved through Jesus Christ, till you come to John, and John keeps talking about the world. And not through, not uh, some people mix up John with the Apostle Paul because Paul talks about the reconciling of the world, but John is seeing the restoration of the world. He's seeing salvation, Jesus Christ establishing his kingdom, reconciling the world unto himself uh, it, it, through the gospel of the kingdom message, through the salvation of the nation of Israel, salvation being to the Jew first. But then reaching the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ will come back and rule the world someday. And John sees that. But see, that's the same John who wrote the book of Revelation where Jesus Christ does come back and reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And so when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you not only see those four aspects, but you all see a progression of time. And uh, that, that, that's new to my understanding and, and uh, something I got real excited about when I saw but now going back to Mark himself, one of the things that we did at the end of last class, and I said there was two things I wanted to try to get done, we didn't, I picked one and didn't get it done, but we have got real close, and, and I'll just pick up. What we're looking at is because Mark shows Jesus Christ as uh, a servant, 
It's interesting all the verses that Mark picks out that points out the hands of Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about that last one last time, (laughs) how the Lord Jesus Christ healed the man that was uh, deaf and dumb. (laughs) <laughs> sticks his finger in his ear and grabs his tongue with his hand. <laughs> and, uh, but See, it's Mark who points out those details for us to realize that the, the, Jesus Christ came as a servant. And uh, he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, that's for sure. And, and he healed that man. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, uh, this is kind of interesting. Look, we'll go there. Interesting in, in this respect, Mike Berry always is concerned about the Lord and laying on of hands and and, you know, the Pentecostals, just, they just make everything of laying on of hands as if they got power. Uh, but, but what's interesting is the Lord himself, uh, uh, he laid his hands on certain ones that was part of the process. But there, there was a thought that the Lord Jesus Christ never laid his hands on someone to cast out demons. until. And I thought that might be true until I found one. <laughs> and, of course, it's Mark who brings it out. In verse 27, uh, they brought unto him this man, I think he's... This is where he's possessed. Yeah, verse 20. And they brought unto him, uh, and they brought unto him, and when they saw him straightway, the spirit, the terror, no. Oh, yeah, okay. It's talking about the spirit taking, taking this young man, throwing him in the fire, and doing all kinds of things with him. Verse 27, it says, But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and, and he arose and when he was come unto the house his disciples asked him privately uh, why could not we uh, cast him out I just realized what that is too that's after he cast out the demons that he took him by the hand so maybe that's still true it, you, you search as well for me, with me did the Lord ever touch you know how all the Pentecostals they're casting out demons laying their hands on them uh, I'm not sure there's a verse that he puts his hands on someone that's demon-possessed. He did put his hands on, we studied last week, someone who was a leopard. But here the demon's already cast out, and this is that one where the disciples, he was so powerful, the disciples couldn't do it. Uh, but, but here's the last one that I really want you to see. Come over to Matthew, uh, Mark uh, chapter 16. Had we run all the verses at the same time, which we were starting to do last week, it, it would be significant to end with this one. Because as you end the book of Mark, not only do you see the Lord still working, but, uh, but you see where he's at. It says in Mark 16, verse 19, it says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Uh, and, and they went forth, preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Uh, that, that verse eight, uh, verse 20 there, the Lord working with them. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is just working, being a servant. And even after he ascends into heaven, uh, the Lord is working with them. He's the one giving them the power to do the things that they did to confirm the word. That is, the, the, the apostles and the signs and wonders that they did. But verse 19, it said, So after that the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And uh, as you talk about hands, here he's sitting down at the right hand of God. He is the, the tool in, in the hand of God the Father. He is the one who's going to execute all the will of God the Father. He is the power uh, of God the Father's right hand. And, uh, and so the Lord Jesus Christ, even using his hand, sit down at the right hand of the Father. So it's just something as you see as you go through the book of Mark. Now, in fact, maybe it would save you some time if we get to this. Uh, look back up in verse... Uh, 15, and, and we'll talk about the gospel of the kingdom uh, soon. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure when. Verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, now the gospel of the kingdom is what's going to be preached in all the world. What's part of the gospel of the kingdom is water baptism. Now, that was required in order to be part of the gospel of the kingdom. And so you see that in verse 16. Uh, it's important to rightly divide the word of truth so you understand that's not the gospel we preach and that's not what we need to do to be saved. But this is what they preach and that's what they needed to do. But verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Uh, just because of some things we're going to say the next hour. You know, there's your, your new Bibles, 
tell you, if not actually do it, they leave from verse 9 all the way to verse 20 out. They say it shouldn't be part of the book of Mark. And, uh, you know, if that, if that was true, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, what's the first thing the apostles did? Yeah, they spoke in tongues. How would you know to expect that? Because the only place that tells you they're going to speak in tongues is Mark. And that's the very verse they want to throw away. If they threw away that verse, you wouldn't know that, it, that, that what's happening in Acts is what the Lord said was going to happen. That's the confirming the signs, uh, confirming the word with signs that follow. His word is confirmed by the fact that they did speak in tongues. But anyhow, they're going to do other things. <laughs> they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now remember, when you take verse 16 in that water baptism there, remember that's part of the gospel of the kingdom. If you think that's necessary, then you, that means you can do verse 17 and 18 as well. And uh, most people know enough. Now some people try to do these things and, and end up dying as a result of it. Uh, anyhow, the, 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 those miraculous events, I want you to see those, how the book of Mark closes with those events. Just, just hang on to that information. Come back to Mark chapter 1. Now, a couple more details I want to give you before we look at the very first verse in Mark. And uh, one of the things is, is everybody who writes about the book of Mark and talks about Mark being, sowing the, the servitude of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he came to serve, uh, always point out that the, the book of Mark, uh, 12, what is it, 12 out of 16 chapters begin with the word and. See, it just boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's the shortest uh, account of the life of Christ. Uh, because you know, Mark, uh, Matthew uh, has uh, 28, and, and Luke has 24, and John has 21. Mark does it all in 16 chapters and connects them with that word and most of the time. But, but the, 17 times he uses the word immediately, and uh, 19 times straightway, meaning nothing hindering, just off and doing. Forthwith, the same idea, uh, directly is the idea, forthwith. And, uh, and there's one place here, even in chapter 1, where it used anon, which you have to look it up, and it means at once. And, uh, and, and Mark is using these terms because a servant is someone who needs to be busy. And Jesus Christ was certainly here to accomplish something, and he was busy doing the Father's will. And, uh, and, and I can point that, some of those details out to you all in the first chapter. Look at, look at chapter 1, look at verse 10. After I talk to, I'll start in verse 9. It came to pass in, these, in, the, uh, in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit, like a dove, uh, descended upon him. So immediately, you know, straightway, something takes place. And verse 11, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So you see how those things are going on. And by the way, the temptations are not listed to you here. Uh, uh, it's the work of Christ, not the, not the person of Christ uh, that, that Mark is writing about, not the, the things that uh, happened to Christ, but the things that Christ did is what Mark focuses in on. Uh, look, look down in verse 18. It says, And straightway... They forsook their nets. And this is where he's starting to call Peter and, and Andrew. Straightway they forsake their nets, down in verse 20. And straightway he called them and they left their nets. That's uh, uh, Andrew and, and, uh, and John. And so they're, they're immediately following him. Verse 21. And they went into Calpurnium and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. So I mean it just, it just immediately showing how the Lord is just busy. You get down to verse uh, 28, and it says, Immediately his fame was spread abroad throughout all the regions round about Galilee. Verse 29, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And then that's where he heals uh, Peter's uh, mother. Uh, verse 31 it says, and, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Uh, Verse 42, isn't that where I want? It says, uh, and he straightly charged them, oh yeah, and forthwith sent them away. And in verse 43, it says, uh, 
Oh, no, that was 43. Verse 42. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and was cleansed and so forth. So anyhow, uh, now that's just one chapter. So you realize when you're reading through the book of Mark, it's like you're going to study the Lord Jesus Christ appearing on the scene like a blaze of glory and then soon gone. And, uh, and that, that's really, when you study the book of Mark, uh, that's what's going to happen. And that's probably why a good reason that we should study it faster, if, we, if possible. Because, uh, because that's, that's how Mark is showing and portraying the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, Now, here's something that's, that's unique. I'm not going to cover all these, but uh, I pointed out to or one already. The first time it caught me, and then I started realizing how many different places and, and found uh, in J. Silo Baxter books, he, he lists all the different things that are extremely unique to the book of Mark. Like, for instance, some people got the idea that if Mark covered the life of Christ faster and left out some of the details, Sermon on the Mount, Temptations, all these other things, that maybe Mark is not significant to study. But so he points out all the things that Mark points out that the others don't. And, and, and it's detail. And it's something that, that someone who would, would be uh, showing the servitude of Christ would point out. For instance, I pointed this out before. In verse 13, you know, he's driven into the wilderness. And it says in verse 13, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and, with, uh, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. I never stopped to think about the wild beast. You know, I was always worried about Satan and the temptations that were taking place. And certainly we study the fact that, that he hungered and thirsted because he was fasting during those 40 days. But, you know, when you're weak and fasting, uh, you're not going to run from the, <laughs> the animals. They start looking for the weak <laughs> prey to take. And, uh, and Mark points that, that out. I, I find that quite interesting. Uh, but over in, in verse... Well, that's not so much different. Let me show you one that... Oh, yeah, this is. Look at chapter 2. You'll recognize this is the place where um, where the man, uh, where the Lord was healing in the house. And in verse 3 it says, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So there, there's, a, there's a man who's in a bed, and, and four men are carrying, them, carrying him. But verse 4 says, And when they were come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now, the other accounts just simply say they lowered him down through the roof. But Mark tells you some details that those guys had to uncover the roof. <laughs> they had to make a hole first to lower the man down. Uh, and, and then it says, uh, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when, he had, when they had broken it up, and so it tells you, you know, how the, the process of doing that, they led him down wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And, and so the, the whole process of taking off the roof and lowering the man down, those details are given to us in, in, the, book of, in the book of Mark. Come over to chapter uh, 4. And uh, in verse 6, other details here. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ is asleep in the ship and, and they're worried about it sinking. And it says, but when the sun was, uh, when the sun was up, it was, yeah, boy, am I thinking, reading the right passage though? Uh, parables, or, oh no, that's not the one I wanted. Where's my passage? Oh, no, I'm reading right place where I have it marked. Where is it? Oh, it's 36. Okay, the where I want. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Verse 36, it says, And when they had went, uh, sent away the multitude, they took him in, as, uh, as he was in the ship, and there were also with him, other, with, with him other little ships. Now see, there's one of those details. All, the, all you read in the other places is that they took him in a ship. Well, you forget there's other ships. And the, think about it. If they're going to be in a storm, there's other ships, and what are they? 
little ships. <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty significant point there. And, and, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Now, all you hear on the other ones is that there's a storm and they're afraid. But you don't find out that the waves are actually coming aboard the ship. No wonder these guys are afraid. It it adds more of the the drama to it here. Verse 38, and it says, "And and, And he was in the hinder part of the ship. Now, notice this. Asleep on a pillow. Mark gives you that detail there, you know. <laughs> the Lord, not, not only is he asleep, you know, I always pictured him piled up, you know, a bunch of rope or something piled up uh, and him laying in the ropes asleep or something. But here he's got a nice comfortable place. He's got a pillow. He's sound asleep. And then he stops and, and stops the storm. And, and the whole point, again, is, is the different things that, that uh, Mark points out. Uh, there's so many of these. I want to give you some of the good ones here. Oh. Look at chapter, and this to me is typical of Mark 9. Now, what aspect of Christ does Mark want us to see? Okay, verse 3, and it says, uh, well, verse 2 says, and after six days, Peter take a, uh, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James, uh, chapter 9, verse 2, uh, into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining exceedingly white as snow, so that no fuller on earth can white them. Now, you, when you read that in the other accounts, you read that his... He began, his glory began to shine forth, and it talks about his brightness. But here, he's describing it uh, exceeding white as snow, and then, ex- and then adds the description, so no fuller on earth can white them, as no fuller on earth can white them. You know, the fuller is the guy, the, uh, the dry cleaners down by the river who tries to get the clothes clean, and there's no one could be as cl- clean as the Lord Jesus Christ appeared in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and, and I would see that, a, a servant, a fuller, how, you know, that, that's a tough job. Back in, you know, they walk on clay, they get their clothes dirty, and he works real hard to get the clothes clean. And, uh, but he could, no man on earth could ever cleanse someone to look as white as the Lord Jesus Christ appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. Anyhow, it just, all them little details are just filled. And if you got rid of the book of Mark, you'd lose so many things like that, that uh, not only show that characteristic that Mark wants to show, but, but also those, those details uh, that add uh, a dimension to the ministry of Christ. Um, I think I'll share this one with you later. Let, let's, let's get to the verse first. Go back to Mark chapter 1. Now, as we start in, in the book, like I say, we can't get too far. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it starts this way. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but but before I even do that, notice the second word in the verse, because I I find this amazing. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, you you might remember, how does Matthew begin his book? Yeah, the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He, he immediately wants to point the connection that Jesus Christ has to David. He's the king that's come to reign over the nation of Israel. So he immediately goes for that. John, or Mark here, starts at, uh, looking at Jesus Christ, but, but not so much the kingship, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person of Jesus Christ. But Mark tells you that this is the beginning of the gospel of Christ. See, when you, when you get to, you've got to compare, to get the point, compare Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1. While you're doing that, how does the book of John begin the book? Anybody quote me John 1.1 1, 1 without looking at Okay, John starts with the beginning, doesn't he? But he starts with the beginning 
that Jesus Christ was already there before the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ already was before the beginning, and then the next verses tell you that He began creation. So His beginning is not the same beginning that you find in the book, uh, book of Mark. But when you, come, when you look at Luke, what Luke does, it'll help you understand what Mark's doing. Luke, in chapter 1, verse 1, well, it, it tells you that... Uh, Verse 3, it says, It seemeth good unto me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mayest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So Luke is going to start writing about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and he says he had perfect knowledge from the very beginning. When Jesus Christ started his earthly ministry... Luke had perfect understanding from the beginning of Christ's ministry, right? Now look at Acts chapter 1. Luke wrote the book of Acts. It becomes real obvious just by reading the two introductions together. He says in verse 1 of Acts, The former treatise have I made thee, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Well, we just read that, didn't we? That's the book of Luke. So what's the book of Acts? It says, he, he, the former treatise was what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto his apostles whom he hath chosen, to whom he showed himself alive and so forth. That word after that in verse 2, that's the introduction to the book of Acts. Because Luke tells you what Jesus began to do and to teach And now after that, the book of Acts is going to tell you what he did after he ascended back into heaven, or just before he ascended back into heaven, and after he ascended back into heaven, how through the Holy Spirit he worked through the apostles. So you got the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and then Acts is going to continue it after Jesus Christ ascends into heaven. Now go back to the book of Mark. And the significance of how it says... The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is a group of people who, who, and they call the church all the time, people looking, and they they ask the question, are you a full gospel church? And I usually will respond something more than you think, more than you know. (laughs) Because when they say a full gospel, what they mean when they ask, are we a full gospel church, and sometimes you'll see churches publicize themselves as full gospel, what they mean is they take the full gospel of Christ. That is, everything that's over there in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 16. Remember, these signs shall follow them that believe. They're going to speak with new tongues, and they're going to cast out devils. They don't just start, well, it's not just salvation, trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior with them. No, they got the full gospel. They speak with tongues, and they cast out devils. But most of them don't handle the deadly snakes. I don't know any of them that drink poison and, and, and prove that they have the full gospel. But, they're, but, but when I say I don't know, Sanja's parents... Her dad, they handled snakes in their, his house. Her, her, his parents were into that. And so they're very much exposed down in the south to the snake handlers. And <laughs> Sanja's dad has seen the pastor die. He'll, he'll tell you about it. Uh, they, they bit him and he, <laughs> that snake bit him and he died. Uh, so anyhow, some people actually try to practice the full gospel, but usually the billboards that you see, you're not going to see snakes in their building. Uh, <laughs> But, they, but yet they're, what they're claiming is you and I, we, we study and we only talk about the cross and being saved, but they have more than us because they have the full gospel. And where do they get that out of? Mark 16. What does the book of Mark cover? The full gospel? No, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not the full gospel. If you stop with Mark 16, you don't have the full gospel. You don't get the full gospel until you come to the Apostle Paul and have the preaching of the cross and what Jesus Christ accomplished in His grace and how He turned from Israel and turned to the Gentiles to give us our gospel message. Paul says in Ephesians, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This is Israel's salvation. This is what God promised to the nation of Israel. And the very book that they try to say they preach the full gospel out of, it tells you at the very beginning, this is only the beginning. This isn't the full gospel. (laughs) And uh, so... Uh, that certainly needs pointed out. Uh, 
And, and it, I kind of just a little bit elaborate on that fact. You know when it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? We'll look at this in more detail when we pick up next week. But, but get, uh, Acts chapter, get Acts chapter 20. Oh, okay, go right to 1 Corinthians chapter 18. Larry, I thought I had time. I saw you getting up. <laughs> Who took your job? <laughs> okay, here's my point. That See, when you talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, understand that the word gospel means good news. Well, next week we'll look at how there's the gospel of the kingdom, there's the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's the what I was going to take you to the book of Acts and show you the gospel of the grace of God. See, that's what Paul preached, the gospel of the grace of God. And, and, and the Apostle Paul uses a term um, uh, in, in Romans chapter 1. He, he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That phrase, the gospel of Christ, the Apostle Paul used that, oh, how many times do I have figured out here? Th- anyhow, that, that is the, uh, I'll share the number of times next time, but, but that is the predominant way that the Apostle Paul talks about the gospel more than 58 times. He, he refers, he doesn't say the gospel of Jesus Christ, he just simply says the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And when he talks about the gospel, the grace of God, and the gospel of Christ, Chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. Look at chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, I might have had you in the wrong place, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. Paul said that the gospel that he preached unto them is how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. See, when we're studying the book of Mark, we're going to study the good news about the person of Jesus Christ. But that's not the full message about Christ. When you come to Paul's epistles, there you're going to learn about the gospel of Christ, and the gospel of Christ involves not just the person of Christ, what he came to do, but what he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul talks about the preaching of the cross, and he preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. The gospel of Christ involves the cross. The gospel of Jesus Christ involves the person. The message for us today, the full gospel message, is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the person of Christ. That's what we're going to get in the book of Mark. But Paul preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the gospel of Christ. That's the gospel, the grace of God, the gospel that saves us. That's the full gospel. So, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank You for the class. And we do pray that, uh, that we'll appreciate the things that Mark says that has a, a different slant as he opens up the, the ministry of Jesus Christ uh, in a way that uh, um, the Roman world could receive Christ and... And Father, we pray that we'll separate the gospel of the kingdom from the gospel of the grace of God as we go through it. But we pray that as well that we might uh, see some new enlightening things as we look at the ministry of Jesus Christ from the gospel of Mark. And remember that the full message completes the, the picture of Christ by the cross work of Christ. And so we thank you for the class. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.